Hey, welcome.、Uh, thank you for joining me today at this product school webinar. Today, I'm going to talk about how to use data for PMs or data as a superpower for PMs. So this is a con.、Uh, this is a topic that is so close to my heart、uh, because、um, a bit of context before getting started. Actually, so before my career as a PM at LinkedIn, I spent actually more years、uh, working as a data scientist than PM. So I know this topic pretty well. And、uh, one thing that I'm really appreciative of my data scientist career is that the skills from being a data scientist really helped me and carry me forward to being a good PM. And one of the、uh, one of the feedback I got from my colleagues, from my peer, from my partner is that how data driven I am in my day to day work, and I really appreciate that I have this skill. And to be honest, I I I def I honestly think that data data is a superpower for PMs, and that's why I'm here. I want to share my experience with you, share a few tips, and hope you can take some take away something from this. All right. So、uh, this is a brief agenda, and、uh, as as I talked about before,、uh, my brief con my br my brief grab background. I'm in PM for the last、uh, three years.、Uh, now I'm in PM in LinkedIn, working on the product marketplace at LinkedIn. And before that, I spent a few years, four or five years, working as the data scientist at Google. And before that, I worked as a, a management consultant、uh, in an analytics capacity. So I ran a lot of analysis. I built a lot of models back in the day where、uh, cloud computing was not even a thing. So three things I want to talk about. First of all, I want to spend some minutes talking about why, as a PM, you should specifically care about data. And then the second thing is I want to give some、uh, examples on how I use data. In my day-to-day -day job, to make a better decision, and then the third one is the top ten tips that you should be data. How can you be more data-driven? All right. So、um, I think I'm going to spend maybe two minutes on this、um, since it's a pretty obvious one, but I do think that there's some new nuanced detail that is pretty important. I want to lay out to you. So、uh, okay, why why personally I think data is important for PMs.、Uh, there are three things. The first thing and the most important thing is it is the ultimate winning card in in an argument or, or any decision making, right? So as you know, as PMs, the most important job、uh, for anyone to be successful is how do you have the best opinion on the table and how do you. Convince other people so people follow your decision, and ultimately, hopefully, you make the good decision. So let's imagine a scenario:、uh, there are multiple people in the room. You have an opinion, I have an opinion, and the CEO has an opinion, right? So most of the time,、um, the CEO's opinion is going to win. But if you can somehow use data to back you up, then your opinion is going to win because only you have the data. So that's the importance of it. Right, and uh, uh, you know,、uh, for example, a lot of people、uh, or a lot of companies they use、uh, user research、uh, as a very important、uh, a lever or or point of proof、uh, to make decisions. I'm not saying user research is useless. I think it has a lot of values. Is I think it's a great way to know directly、uh, about what what the user think. But as we know it, right, not every user always do. Exactly what they say that that they will do. So the only way to know how a product performs and how a、uh, user behaves and how、uh, and where the opportunity is is by looking at the data, looking at your logs, which records faithfully the behavior of your users. So okay, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, uh, uh, data has a very high ceiling in the sense that. There's a lot of things that you can, or a lot of values you can actually extract with the amount of data and also the 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 the, the, the sophistication of the tools that you have for data. So remember、uh, the first、uh, the first time I was、uh, working on data, which is more than ten years ago.、Um, I was working on. I remember cleaning some data on、uh, some transactional user data for a gas utility company in Southern California. And so the the querying job took me three days because I was doing the job in like loaded into R in my、uh, in my laptop. 
on my desk, right? So if I do the same job today at LinkedIn using other technology, it will probably take me like 12 seconds. So the point I'm trying to make is that now today you definitely have a superpower because you have great tools, great technology to do things at scale, right? You can do a lot of things that is not possible 10 years ago. Uh, for example, a lot of the sampling technique might not be relevant or necessary because all you need to do is just always query the, um, the entire amount of data. And you can look at examples, you can see the pattern. There's a lot you can do. And the third thing, uh, last but not least, is basically like, you know, people never talk about this, right? Because people don't want to talk about the, the hard truth, the money, which is if you can somehow combine your data skill with your core skill, which is whatever you're doing as a job, right? For example, you can combine data with design skills, combine data with product management skills, combine data with, uh, you know, marketing skills, then you can... Be in my opinion, 10 times your income over the long run, right? If you can do this powerful combo of data plus X, it means that usually you will be a superstar among your peers in your current, in your current role and your company. So that's how, what I say to my friends all the time. If you can write SQL, you will be a superstar here. All right, so a lot of things here, right? A, a lot of, uh, hopefully it's new, some of this is new information, but the, the point I'm trying to make you is, uh, trying to make to, to you is that data is really important and you should do it really well and you should care about it. And the good news is it's not that, it's not that hard as you can imagine. Okay, so uh, in the next section, I'm gonna talk about uh, how I use data in my day-to-day -day work as a PM. And before I get started, a couple of things I want to lay out, right? So the first thing is, uh, this is not meant to be a uh, like crash course on SQL 101 or Big Data 101, right? I don't think it's a good time of you. Uh, it's a good use of your time today to talk about that. Uh, so I will avoid using any technical terms or details. And then the second thing I want to lay out is that uh, these examples are good in the sense that they reflect what that typical PM will do in, on a daily basis. So when you uh, hear or when you, uh, when you walk through those examples together, right, don't think of it as I'm just telling you something, you know, put the example in your own shoes, uh, thinking about, hey, if, I, if I'm, you know, I'm facing a similar situation in my current role, what would I do? Would I do anything different? And I'm happy to learn anything that you will do different. You know, it's something that I haven't done. Uh, it's a great learning opportunity for me as well. So the first example I'm going to give you is uh, basically how do I use data to make uh, product trade-offs? So what is a product trade-off, right? I'm sure you have heard of it. You know, uh, you're talking about it. Everyone's talking about it. But I still want to re reiterate on how I understand it. So in my opinion, product trade-off is basically, you know, the decision of what to build, right? You have a team of 10 engineers plus a couple of cross-functional teams. And every day or every week, let's be honest, right? You're thinking about, hey, what, what should I do, right? What should I do in the next few weeks? What should I do in the next few quarters? And what should I do in the next one to three years? I, in my opinion, that's basically what a PM's job is, right? You, you're paid to do that. Uh, but making those decisions is pretty hard. Uh, it's challenging, it's fun, but it is really, really hard. So I'll give an example, right? Uh, you know, let's imagine you are a PM working on LinkedIn, um, which is, let's just make it simple, right? LinkedIn uh, does a lot of stuff these days, but at its core, it's still a recruiting uh, company, right? Let's say most people go to LinkedIn when they're looking for jobs. And the recruiters are there, they're the paying customers uh, who are looking for talents, all right? So imagine you're the PM, you're the lead PM for the entire LinkedIn recruiting product. Uh, and the team is trying to come up with ideas of how to make the business more successful. And there are two ideas on the table. The first one is, hey, let's uh, uh, you know, let job seekers right, uh, put more skills on their profile. 
uh, for example, you know, JavaScript, you know, uh, uh, public speaking, Excel, you know, um, project management tools, et cetera. So that's the first idea. And the second idea is to, hey, let's build a, a scheduling tool for recruiters because for some reason we think that's a pain point for recruiters, right? They cannot get, they cannot always get a hold of the candidates. So as a PM, how do you decide? So at first, right, this is a kind of a confusing question um, and it's a hard one because A, both ideas are great. B, those two ideas are not that comparable, right? One is talking about seekers, you know, something regarding, you know, beefing up their profile. The second one is regarding building a tool for uh, recruiters to easily talk to the, the job seekers, right? So how do we make the decision here? Now, this is how I would go about this. A few steps, right? But it's, you know, it's kind of that framework. The first one I will think about is basically take a step back and think about what is the top line metrics, right? So in this example, let's just make it simple. Let's say for the recruiter process, uh, for the recruiter product to work on LinkedIn, you we basically care about how many hires the recruiter will get on the platform, right? Because ultimately recruiters come to LinkedIn not to just spend their time browsing, right? They're here to get the candidates and make them an offer, and hopefully they will accept the offer. So let's say the top line metric, the more the most important North Star is the number of hires. Then the next step is to find a, a set of proxy metrics uh, in my own definition uh, that can somehow break down that top line metrics to a more meaningful and actionable metric. So the way I would approach it is I will think about a uh, the journey of a recruiter on a platform. And again, to make it simple, let's assume that in this scenario, um, a recruiter always reaches out to the candidate, not the other way around, right? So if that's the case, then the journey will be, as a recruiter, you know, I post a job on LinkedIn, right? And then uh, the job gets sent to a candidate and I find a good match, right? I see like a ten, uh, maybe a list of 10 people. Then I'd reach out to some of those and then I get responses from some of those. And then hopefully I get an interview with some of those candidates. And then the, re the interview process happens. I got some hires. All right. So when we lay out our uh, proxy metrics like this, I think the ana analysis becomes a much simpler, right? Because as you can see, um, the, those two ideas actually map to specific part of that journey. For example, idea number one, uh, make seekers uh, put more skills on their profile, kind of maps to the second one, right? Which is find a match. Because the more stuff you have, the more skills you have on your profile is kind of having a, it's kind of similar to having a skill on your resume, which increases your likelihood of being matched, which increases the, the relevancy or the accuracy of the match. And then the second idea maps to maybe one of the like, get responses, right? Uh, which is uh, if the recruiter can more easily schedule a follow-up phone call of uh, phone calls with the candidates, then there will be more responses and there will be more interviews scheduled. So now we have a framework, right, to compare these two uh, these two ideas together. So the next step is to basically go to our database and then try to size the impact. For example, two different things, right? Two different ideas, uh, who, uh, which will increase two different metrics, but both metrics help to increase the ultimate metric. So now it's a numbers game, right? Which idea will give us the higher lift on the total metric? So that's the part where we can go to the database and get some quantitative data. All right, so that the four steps are basically how you would, I would approach this question. And then uh, last one, but not the least, right? A bonus thing that I think is quite unique and interesting about this specific uh, question is if we see that, for example, right, um, uh, the, the schedule rate, let's say, right, is not that great. Meaning, for example, only 10% of the candidates actually uh, respond to a, to a recruiter's request. If we just look at that data alone, we might have the conclusion that, hey, the, the scheduling or 
part sucks, right? We, uh, idea B is actually a great idea. But I would actually uh, question this a little bit further, right? So what is the real reason behind this? Maybe it's because, yes, the scheduling experience really sucks. People don't see their messages, right? Or the message failed, so, so the message cannot get across. Or I think more likely is that recruiters probably just can connect or talk to those candidates off the platform, right? They don't have to send a message or email on LinkedIn to the candidates. They can just call them directly. So let's first verify that, right? Which root cause? is causing the low scheduling rate and then make a decision. So that's another important part about this entire analysis is just you not only need to do the analysis to break down the metrics to query the data, but you also have to question the validity of the data to see what data is actually accurate and how you can interpret the data to form your decision in the correct way. All right. So the next example I'm going to give you, or the second most used use case of data at, at, at my own job is to run A-B test. So uh, I'm not, again, I'm not going to uh, uh, spend your time on a crash course on A-B test, right? There's a bunch of literature and material on the internet, uh, but I do want to stress that uh, A-B test at its core is basically a uh, kind of the most effective or the single tool to test if a feature actually works. Uh, this is really, really important because at the end of the day, right, you cannot claim any credit or you cannot prove that you have done improvement to the product or moving your metrics if you don't get the enough result from an A-B test. And unfortunately, a lot of the teams are doing A-B tests in a very wrong way, even at a company established company like Google or LinkedIn. Right, uh, there are a lot of you know uh, pitfalls to avoid, but one of the more uh, obvious ways, and I can't believe people are still are still doing this in the wrong way, is that they just do a pre and post analysis. What I mean by that is, say you launch a feature today, right? You want to measure the impact of the feature on this on our users. We basically just calculate the metrics after we launch it and calculate the metrics before we launch it and uh, do the minus, right? To see if there's any change in the metric pre and post. So this is really wrong because it is not the right way to, to, to do the causal, causal uh, conclusion uh, if your metric, ha if your feature has actually increased the metric, right? Uh, because during the time, a lot of other factors can happen. Maybe there's a war happening, right? Maybe there's uh, election results coming up. Many factors that is out of your feature can increase or decrease the metric. So, you know, you're basically not saying anything about the result of, of, of your feature. Um, so that's just the one basic example I'm going to give you, right? Which is, you know, just if you do, you know, first you need to do A-B test for every feature you run. But then the second thing, more importantly, is do it in the right way. If you cannot do it, please work in the team that has the people, the right people to do it, maybe working with the data scientists, maybe working with the engineers, or leveraging tools like Amplitude, you know, optimizely, those tools are great to help you set up the A-B test in the right way and to measure the results that is actually believable. Okay, so the third example, uh, again, last but not the least is how data is important to rally the team. I think this is one of the most or more e neglected one, where right? people always talk about, hey, how data can help the decision making, how data can help A-B test, but people never talk about the aspect of how data can kind of bring the team together. And I personally feel very strongly about this because <clears throat> maybe fortunately I work in a team that is very data driven. I work with a lot of engineers who are very data driven. So <clears throat> I hear a lot about, hey, where's the data? How, where can we see the data? Uh, what does the data say? So you also help me, right, to, to, to speak the same language and then to you know, resonate with the team if I bring a lot of table to the table, uh, a lot of data to the table. Um, I think apart from that, right, it's also very important that uh, <clears throat> you always tell data to your team because at the end of the day, your success is determined by the success of your team. And the success of your team is determined by the metrics, right? Which is 
how many revenue you have brought to the company, uh, how many, uh, how much uplift you have done to your metrics, right? Which is your OKR. So personally, in my day to day job, I try to convince or you know, whenever I have any conversations or meetings with my engineering team, with my cross-functional partner teams, I use data, right? The conversation can be uh, like a launch event where we are basically doing a readout for a previously launched or ramped feature. I just give them a bunch of data to see, you know, this is the impact that we have on the metric. And this is some of the interesting behavior we have observed from the users. How do they use it? And uh, there's also some anecdotal stories we heard from our users. So it really helps the engineers to understand their impact to the feature and the impact of the feature to the actual users. And then the second type of conversation might be in a situation where uh, we talk about strategies, right? Before the, the quarter begins, uh, everyone get together to talk about strategy, talk about roadmap planning. And you know, there's certain people, right? Who want to do the kind of the, uh, the MBA style top down, say, hey, you know, this is the blue sky thinking, this is a corporate strategy, we want to move to, the, to that space in two to three years. Um, those are great, uh, but those do not resonate really well with engineers. My understanding with engineers is they're really precise, right? They want to, they want to see the facts, they want to see numbers, they want to sense that tangible thing that they can cling on to. So when you show them the numbers, say, hey, you know, based on the numbers, this is where we are as a product. This is our metrics. This is our users. And then in order to move our metrics from X to Y, we need to do A, B, C, three things. And then each thing will give us, you know, I don't know, 15% towards that goal. So together we can do 40, 45% in total. And we can, I think we can do that in the next quarter by building these features. When you uh, articulate your strategy that way, it makes sense a lot to the engineers, right? And everyone is buying into the idea, uh, they will do it. And uh, once they are doing it, right, they feel more uh, excited about it because they believe in it. So that's kind of the vicious cycle you, you, you want to create. All right, um, ho hopefully that's very helpful. Um, and uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about is, again, you know, I, I, I talked about a lot of the uh, longer stories, you know, my personal learning, stuff like that. I want to give you, you know, kind of by size style, right? Like the top 10 or eight tips I can give you as a data-driven PM. Uh, so first of all, I apologize. You know, I, I know in the, uh, in the schedule of the event, I said 10 tips. And then when I wrote the slides, I realized I don't even have 10 tips, right? So I'm going to give you eight, but hopefully you're still happy. So the first one is uh, you should have a basic understanding of how data works. So by that, I mean the underlying technology of how data is generated, how data is stored, and how data is queried uh, on your machine, right? So for example, you should have a, a, a grasp understanding of uh, you know, the entire process, right? When a user interacts with your app, what kind of data are being generated? And how does that data uh, be, be transported from the user's phone to your company's server? And then in the server, how the data is being crunched, being cleansed, being form formatted, being standardized, and then how data uh, is, you know, transferred in a format that you can query it using SQL. That is really helpful when, uh, when you talk to the engineers and when you query the data. And then the second tip is learn to write SQL. This is a no brain, uh, this is a no brainer, right? You should definitely do it. And the my advice is just learn the basics. You don't have to write a very complex query, but learn the techniques that can just get you to, to, to do the job. The third tip is learn probability and statistics 101. So what I mean by that is still a very basic understanding of the basic probability theories and statistics for two reasons. The first one is it will help you with A-B tests. We talk about A-B tests, it's really important and it's really important to do it, right? Have a sense of basic understanding of, you know, for example, hypothesis testing, A-B testing, you know, what is T-statistics, how to read those kind of uh, metrics for, for a test. It helps you a lot. I see a lot of PM friends who are great PMs, by the way, 
but they struggle with this. And then when they struggle with this, they have to rely on other people to make decisions, which slow down their process. And then the second thing is it helps you, it helps you to speak the same language as, as your data scientist friends or your data engineering friend. For example, false positive, false negative, if you don't know the terminology, if you don't understand them well, first of all, don't use it because you, know, you will sound pretty bad. But then uh, learn what it is and what it means. So it helps you to uh, build that rapport with your colleagues. The fourth tip is understand your metrics really well, right? So we also talk about this when you're doing a product trade-out decision. The most important step, the foremost step is to understand the metrics, understand why you're doing cer a certain feature. And if you build it, right, how, like what is the, how do you get a signal to measure the success of it, right? How do you know it's actually successful? Number five, build it fast and test it. This is something that I learned throughout my, my startup years, right? Uh, in startups, the, the theme, right, is, is survival. It's not always about, you know, finding the holy grail, the, the golden idea, and just run with it. It's always about reiterating, right? So uh, my advice also to myself is that sometimes you got to focus on the learnings, right? Just building features, t have a mechanism to test it, and then do a lot of those. That's the only way you can iterate fast and improve your feature until you reach that product market fit. Tip number six, broadcast your idea whenever possible. So this is similar to the point we made earlier, which is uh, be, use data to rally your team together, right? So when you have a data, uh, you have that power and remember to use that power whenever possible. And I'm sure you guys have, you know, uh, remembered examples where this same person talks about the same piece of data over and over again in different meetings. So that's the exact thing that you should do as well. Tip number seven, be friends with your data scientists on the team. There are great resources, right? And there are very expensive resources. It's very hard to get a data scientist that can do their job well, efficiently, and can understand a product. And more importantly, it's willing to help. So be friends with them, you know, speak their same language, you know, don't just tell them, hey, you know, I got it. Can you put some data for me, right? That's not going to sound very good, right? But if you know the, de if you know the, uh, the techniques, right, you can have a more, uh, uh, you know, an equal discussion with them. And that's how you can be friends with them and get more support from them in the long run. Uh, tip number A, know where to stop. So this is a very interesting one, right? You see there's three bullet points underneath them, but the meta point for the tip is that by the end of the day, right, uh, time is very short and uh, a good PM should be able to gather as much as infor as much information as possible in a short amount of time and in a very uh, small effort. And your job is not a data scientist, right? Your job is not to, you know, crunch the data all day long, you know, uh, have a full on analysis. Your job is to just to get the right enough signal for you to make a decision in a kind of comfortable and confident way. So the first thing is uh, too much data, spending too much analysis will get you nowhere. It will burn you out and you will get into this uh, analysis paralysis, right? Where you find out, okay, this is rabbit hole. You know, there's a data that I find out, but to prove that I need to get another data and then to get to, to that data, I need to spend two more days to crunch another database, which is then crazy, right? N no one will see the value of that efforts anyway. The second thing to notice is uh, you need to be very comfortable with ambiguity, right? Sometimes it just, know where you can get that data and uh, it's fine, right? You know, people do decisions or make decisions without any concrete data anyway. So that's why you need to uh, do the third one, which is you need to leverage the qualitative data as well, right? Qualitative data can be, you know, user, uh, user feedbacks, you know, user research, or, you know, like your past experience of a previous product, uh, opinions from your colleague, you know, or something you've seen on the internet. So everything you can leverage, you should all leverage and put the whole story together. Okay, so that's the eight tips I want to share with you. Um, so as a closing 
closing thought, right? I, I, uh, yeah, first of all, I, I really appreciate the time. I, I appreciate you guys joining this uh, webinar. I hope it helps a lot. Um, uh, but, you know, as a closing thought, I do want to make sure that, uh, that you can understand how data is important as a P, uh, to a PM and how I have benefited uh, as a PM, right, uh, based on my past uh, data skills. And I definitely think that there's a, a lot of confusion in the field about, okay, what is data, right? And how do I use data? And what data is important, what data is not important? Should I use SQL, should I not? So hopefully this also clears out some of the confusion and the noise out there and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I can guide you through a kind of clear path in how you should beef up this superpower. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to comment me on LinkedIn. I work there, I'm always there, it's part of my job. So yeah, hope to connect with you guys uh, soon in the future.